things interest different people. I once went to a Scottish convention in Santa Rosa with a friend who had some Scottish blood in her. After three or four hours of bagpipe music, I really had all the bagpipe music I could use for the day. To my untrained ear, uh, it sounded all the same. There were many variations, many pieces I had not heard, but the boundaries of bagpipe music I had fully explored. The same is true for me in watching competitive bowling on TV or watching clothes tumble in the laundromat. <laughs> in each case, I can't lose myself in the experience for very long. Uh, and I know that it is when I lose myself that I find out more of who I am. Little kids may be enchanted uh, when I read to them the story, The Pokey Little Puppy. And they'll say, oh, read it again, read it again. Or later in life, uh, uh, Superman magazine or Mad Magazine, uh, or playing cowboys and Indians, or computer games like the Mario Brothers. Or later yet, it may be school football, rah, 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 or the captivation of hours-long phone calls. Oh, did you hear what Marcy and Jason did? Oh, they, were, they went out last night to the movies together and da 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 All of these enchantments are natural in their time. What gets... Oh, what gets scary for the adult that sees the world still in terms of high school football or mad magazine? Oh, when they think that Superman comics are the acme of human creativity. <laughs> There's an enchantment that's appropriate for adults. One that's not a replay of the same old juvenile stuff. It's part of being a well-educated person. Um, it's attending the best plays that there are, and there are lots of them. Or hearing the finest music, and there are many kinds of the finest music. Or by reading the great texts which our civilization has given us. Uh, those all hold the prospect of real enchantment, continuing enchantment that you can have throughout your entire life. An enchantment in which you can lose yourself and in doing so become more of who you really have the potential to be. Philosophy, dealing with the truth, when to tell it, that's a hard question. Robert Ringer has written, quote, a good rule I have established for keeping myself from being lulled into the little white lie trap is contained in the fishbowl theory, which states, your chances of going to heaven are directly proportional to the degree to which you live every moment as though the whole world were watching. When I picture the great men and women who have lived, it seems to me that they have lived their whole lives as if the whole world were watching watching all the time as if the cameras were always rolling. And with that consciousness, the little white lies stop. 
It's not a matter of thinking I can get away with this fib. No one will catch on. It is a matter of thinking I don't do that. Even more than the concept that the whole world is watching, I am watching and I don't lie. You're a peasant girl named Joan. You come from Lorraine in France, lived almost 600 years ago, and you hear voices. And your picture, Joan, your picture is the most prominent picture I display in my house. You changed the face of Europe. It was in the early 1400s. England and France were at their usual wars with each other. Almost a century before that 14, early 1400s, uh, the King of England made a nice statement. He said, I am also the King of France. <laughs> Both countries were still suffering. Uh, from the Black Death. You remember that was 1350 approximately, and there had been successive mi more minor waves of the Black Death since that time. Uh, and about a third of Europe had died in the wave, the first wave of the Black Death in 1350. And now we're in the early part of the 1400s, and England was doing a very nice job of carving up France. Uh, at the Battle of Angicourt uh, in the early 1400s, the score was uh, four or five hundred Englishmen were dead, and almost 7,000 Frenchmen had died, and another 1,500 were captured and taken off to England. Uh, step by step, Normandy had been conquered in France, and then Paris fell to the English also. And at the head of France, uh, or what was left of it, was a fellow named Charles VII, uh, also known as Dolphin Charles. Dolphin Charles. And he was a wimp. He leaves Paris before it's conquered and heads south to France. <sighs> then royal marriages happen as they do to cement uh, the ties and the Treaty of Troyes in 1420 and the English wipe out all possibilities of Dolphin Charles being the legitimate successor to the throne. Even the University of Paris, those turncoats, <laughs> helped write the Treaty of Troyes to push Dolphin Charles out of the picture. Then the English push southward. <laughs> and they want to capture the city of Orleans, the city of Orleans, because that was a central crossroads, strategic spot to capture. And so they surround that city of Orleans, and they're going to starve it out. Dolphin Charles, I don't know what I should call him, Dolphin Charles or Dolphin Charlie, uh, didn't know what to do. He said, oh, oh, oh my, oh my or whatever they say in French, uh, he was dithering. He felt himself vanquished and deposed, poor Dolphin Charles. <laughs> then, well, in today's language, it would have been Dolphin Charles' secretary, came in with a message, uh, there's a Joan peasant girl to see you, sir. And the Dolphin kept her waiting for two days. We have her words, Joan's words, as she met him. She said, Fair Dolphine, I am called Joan the Maid. The King of Heaven sends you word by me. You shall be crowned and consecrated king in the city of Reims. And of course, Reims, by the way, is deep up there in enemy territory, <laughs> 
fat chance that he was going to be crowned king anyway, but in Reims? So the city of Orleans had been under siege for more than six months. People getting kind of hungry because they couldn't order in Pizza Hut or whatever else. Joan puts on her battle clothes and leads what's left of Dolphine's raggedy, ratty band of warriors or fighters or soldiers, the has-beens. And within a week, she lifts the city of its siege. Then she blasts into enemy territory, heading toward Reims, battle after battle, town after town, on June 10th, on June 15th, on June 18th, and finally at Reims, Dolphine Charles, the wimp, is crowned on July 17th as king. <sighs> then Joan is captured and tortured. They couldn't make stick the charge that she was the hound of the evil one, dog of the devil. They tried. And torture was effective in those days generally. Instead, they sent her to the stake to be burned, and the only charge that they could use was that she dressed in men's clothes. At the execution, as the flames burned Joan of Arc, one observer lamented, we have burned a saint. Books, literature, I've extolled their virtues on many programs here, but I can say just the opposite. I and you on television, through this medium, uh, can do a lot of things that books can't do. You can shut your eyes and you can still hear me. Uh, if you shut your eyes on a book, it gets very dark and quiet. I can move around. Oh, you yeah, love that. Mm -hmm. uh, the best you can do to get movement in a book is to buy a little pop-up book for kids. I can point to diagrams. Books can't do that. Uh, I can add music to my speaking here. And books can't easily do that. Why then should you read when you've got me <laughs> and everything else on TV? Let me give you eight reasons. Number one, a TV set is difficult to carry around. You can't go outside very easily and sit under a tree with it. That may change in the future, but right now most TV sets are not the kind that are portable. Number two, reasons why books instead of TV. Homer, Aeschylus, Cicero, and Dostoevsky are rarely found on TV. Number three, if Hawthorne's Scarlet Letter were to appear on TV, it would be in highly abridged form. Number four, the speed at which you read is your speed. TV happens at generally the lowest common denominator so that 99% of the people watching can stay on board. Number five, why you want to read books instead of watch TV. Books are quiet. Oh, quiet. In this jangly world, it's nice to have such a respite. If you want sound, read out loud. Number six, TV situational comedies, sitcoms, are produced at a hectic pace. Oh, we've got to, we've got to find another joke about Dan Quayle to stick in there. Oh, 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 very few of the great texts were produced on a word processor at 80 words per minute. 
Number seven, the great texts were written by those one in a million individuals who have thought most deeply, seen most clearly. They're not, they're not quite the same as the reporter writing down scribbling words on the fly to report oh, the great murder trial of the century. Last, books can go into detail. A writer can spend a whole 60 seconds describing a valley, its trees, the brooks in it. I've only got seconds to do this whole segment on literature. In fact, I'm out of time. Uh, please turn off this TV and go read a book. Wow, those antlers of yours have an empty. Do you ever think of taking those off? I ever tell you the story, uh, Opus, about, uh, I read it in a, an article named A Dumb Way to Die by Simone Wilson. She wrote it. It's a good story to, that you should tell the people that are important to you. And it's a story about a mom whose name was Janice, and apparently if this really happened, and Janice had a two-year-old son named Jason. Okay, I'll be Janice and you be Jason, okay? You be my two-year-old son. And Janice and Jason were driving uh, to make a short trip to the market. And Janice was driving because Jason wasn't old enough to drive. He was only two. And Jason was standing in the front seat right next to his beloved mom, Janice. And in another car, Jeff was going downtown to get a haircut. And Jeff missed the stop sign. And Jeff went right through the stop sign. And Janice put on the brakes real quick. And the cars never touched. They didn't hit each other. But Jason flew forward and hit his head against the dashboard and when he did he broke his neck and died and the only mark that was on Jason was a little moon-shaped mark on his forehead that matched the moon-shaped dent in the dashboard. One of the marks of the great texts is that they address the human condition. This is especially of the, true of, of the book that is on virtually every list that's been compiled of the great texts, and that book is the Bible. Uh, the human condition, the, the Bible doesn't just have one way of describing the human condition. Uh, it's not just an oversimplified, you are sinful kind of business at all. Uh, there's many different descriptions of the human condition. In parts of scripture, we're praised and said to be created a little lower than the angels. In another part of scripture, we are, or to use the old fashioned word, wooed, uh, like a lover courts his beloved. It's especially true, say, in the Song of Solomon's, Song of Solomon in the Old Testament. Um, we are put in our place to describe the human condition. In the last chapters of Job, God confronts Job with, can you bind the chains of the Pleiades, or loose the cords of Orion, which are two constellations in the sky. One of my favorites in describing one particular aspect 
of the human condition uh, is in the sixth chapter of Proverbs. Uh, it reminds me uh, of a distraught parent uh, with a teenage son, say, uh, who spent the first month of his summer vacation in front of the television set. Uh, I like the NSR, NRSVP edition, uh, translation of this particular one. Uh, but you can hear the parent nagging to the son, Go to the ant, you lazy bones. Consider its ways and be wise. Without having any chief or officer or ruler, it prepares food in summer and gathers its sustenance in harvest. How long will you lie there, O oh lazy bones? When will you rise from your sleep? A oh, little sleep, a little slumber, uh, a little folding of the hands to rest, oh, and poverty will come upon you like a robber. Sixth chapter of Proverbs. People really haven't changed that much, I don't think, in the last two or three thousand years. That's one reason why the great texts remain relevant and popular. We've heard a lot about the bell curve lately. There's a book out by that title. I haven't read it yet, but I suspect it deals with what in statistics is called the normal distribution. Here's a bell curve. On it, I have marked out standard deviations on the horizontal axis. Remember, standard deviations are how far out the data is spread. The top of the curve represents the mean average also the median and mode average, because the curve is symmetrical. On a normal bell-shaped distribution, 68% of the area is within one standard deviation of the mean. This is standard statistics stuff that becomes highly useful for predicting. The shaded area within one standard deviation is 68%. Under the whole curve, it's 100%. Secondly, the second last fact here is that within two standard deviations of the mean, 95% of the data fall. Now a real life example. Let's take IQ, which is part of what apparently the bell curve book is about. IQ scores are designed so that the mean average of all the IQ scores is 100. Half the people will fall below 100, and half the people will fall above it. The IQ scores are designed also, in addition to having a mean of 100, a mean average, of having a standard deviation of 15, 15 points. Therefore, if we look at Oh, let us say 100 people who have IQ scores listed, and they're just picked from the population in general. We would generally expect that 68% of them would fall within one standard deviation of the mean, which means 68 people out of that 100 would be within one standard deviation. Now, one translate that. Since the standard deviation is 15 points on an IQ test and the mean is 100, we would expect that 68% of the people fall between 85 and 115 points. Two-thirds. 95% of the people fall between, within two standard deviations of the mean. So of 100 people taking the test, then 95 of them on the average would fall between 70 and 130. This question, if you scored 130 on an IQ test, 
How many people would have an IQ larger than yours? All right, you are two standard deviations above the mean, and there are a hundred people taking the test, say, the answer would be that since 95% of the people fall within two standard deviations, we would expect that 5% of the people would fall on the outside of those standard deviations between 170 and 130. Since the curve is symmetrical, 2.5% of the population would be below 70, and 2.5% of the population would be above 130. That's the answer.